Hello, my name is John Bodner. I'm a software engineer at Capital One, and I'm here to tell you Go is boring. So a couple of people watching, you've come to this virtual conference to learn more about Go and why it's so great, and here I am ruining your expense report. So before you switch over to YouTube for the next 25 minutes, let me explain. When I say that Go is boring, I am not criticizing Go. I think it's fantastic. I've been working as a software engineer for nearly 23 years, and I've been writing programs for about 38 years. In that time, I've used a lot of languages, and I love programming languages. I love learning about their features, what changes they make compared to other languages that came before them. So let's take a tour through some of these languages and see what they added, what new and exciting features they include. I started programming in the early 1980s with BASIC on one of these computers, a Commodore PET. Anyone else recognize it? Yeah, 8K of RAM, green and black screen, built-in tape deck for storing programs. It had everything. Incidentally, this USB-C charger is about the same amount of RAM as that Commodore PET, and the CPU is about 40 times faster. So, wow, things change. BASIC was pretty limiting, so I eventually learned other languages like Pascal and C, and they taught me the joy of uh, manual memory management and structured programming. Later, I learned C++. I learned about object-oriented programming. There was inheritance and abstract types and public and private and friends and operator overloading and templates and so many more features. And I haven't written a line of C++ in years, maybe decades at this point, but it has continued to add features. So here's just a few of the things that have been added to the past 10 years. Now there's type inference and four range loops and lambda functions and there's a new function syntax and strongly typed enums and Unicode strings and thread locals. In the mid-90s, I learned Java. Java showed me that you can use a VM to make your code portable and also that OO can actually be comprehensible. It freed me from manual memory management with this garbage collector and each release of Java seemed to include yet another algorithm that made garbage collection better in some special case and a bunch of settings to tweak their performance. Java also had threads that are easy to launch and two different types of exceptions, checked and unchecked, that were made it easier to handle your errors. But Java didn't stop there, no, it just kept adding features. There were generics and enumerations and a four range loop and annotations and aspect-oriented programming and try blocks that auto-close resources. And type inference for generics with a diamond operator and modules and lambdas and three different timer implementations in the standard library. Whole new time of type inference, other than the one that added for generics was added in two. A new switch statement that's functional and they just added records and I think they're adding value types too at some point. There are so many features in Java right now, I know I'm forgetting some of them. I've also spent some time writing JavaScript. Now at first, JavaScript wasn't all that interesting, but look at what it has now. Modern JavaScript has class declarations and modules and iterators and generators and constants and better scoping rules if you use let instead of r, and please do that. Promises, reflection, async and await, spread operators, even more. And this is all pretty neat and interesting, right? And I've written some Python too. Now Python has been around for a long time, but it keeps growing features too. You know, with this big migration from Python 2 to Python 3, that's done, right? Um, but each new release of Python 3 adds in some new features, like formatted string literals in Python 3.6. And boy, there are just so many ways to format strings in Python. And there are also now underscores and numbers and data classes and type annotations. And Python has a sync and await also. And this is new colon equals operator and just more and more stuff. But we're not done with languages and their features. Mozilla decided that they need a new language to replace C++, which, to be honest, pretty good idea. So they created Rust, and Rust's big advance is that it introduced this entirely new way to manage memory. So if you've never seen Rust, this is interesting. Developers have to mark up their code to indicate ownership of allocated memory, and the compiler ensures there's only one single writer at, at any time. Now, this is pretty amazing, but it takes a bit of skill to get the compiler happy with your code, and it sometimes just like end up marking up sections of your code as unsafe and telling the compiler just to trust you. Apple decided that they needed their own language also to replace Objective-C, and again, honestly, probably a pretty good idea. So they created Swift, which has its own flavor of automatic memory management called automatic reference counting, which came from Objective-C. Swift has tons of interesting features. There's inheritance, exceptions, generics, and more. In addition to the regular control structures you see in languages, there's a guard keyword that checks if a condition is true or if a variable can be set so you can exit a function early. Swift lets you find subscripts for user defined classes with a subscript keyword. There are lazy properties that don't initialize so you call them. Computer properties also that are accessed just like fields on a class, but they're really methods behind the scenes. 
And there was lots of these exciting features, just new ideas being tried out in Swift. Now, I can go on, but I think you get the point. If you look around the world of programming languages, every language has lots of interesting features with lots of constant additions to these languages. And really, this is all pretty exciting. But you know, it feels like you can just never catch up with all the ideas in all these languages. And then there's Go. You know, the best way to think about Go is all the things that it doesn't do. So first of all, it doesn't have a fancy virtual machine like Java and Python and Ruby and JavaScript. Go code compiles to native code, which is something that Swift and Rust do also. But Swift and Rust use LLVM, the latest hotness in compiler technology. Go doesn't do that, it has its own compiler, and it's a little bit boring. For the language geeks out there, it does SSA, but it still doesn't do a lot of optimizations. And the best thing you can really say about this compiler is that it runs pretty fast. Go doesn't have exceptions. Most of these modern languages use exceptions to handle errors, and the ones that don't, like Rust, use optional to indicate something is either a value or an error. Go doesn't have either feature. It makes you return errors back using its ability to return multiple values from a single function. Go doesn't have inheritance. Now, I should say Go doesn't have implementation inheritance. It does have interface inheritance by one of its few new features, the implicit interface. Go doesn't have method overloading or function overloading, and it certainly does not have operator overloading. You get to use a method name once per type and a function name once per package. If you have similar functionality for different types, you just have to use a different name for your functions. This is something that every other type language has done since C, which dates to the 1970s. But Go says no, developer has to do the name mangling, not the compiler. Go doesn't have a way to say a struct is immutable. It has constants, but in Go, a constant is just a name for a number or a string. Go doesn't have enum, just that weird iota thing that's borrowed from APL, which is a language from 1970s. And the big missing feature, the one that's launched a thousand blog posts, including a couple of my own, Go doesn't have generics, yet. To be more precise, Go doesn't have user-defined generics. The maps and slices and channels and some built-in functions are generic, but developers don't currently have a way to create their own container types or generic functions or optionals. And we'll talk more about that yet in just a bit. Let's talk about the features that Go does have. There's a garbage collector, which is nice, but so do most languages, with the exception of Rust and Swift these days. Unlike Java, Go doesn't have a bunch of different collectors for lots of knobs to tweak. It is a single GC algorithm with just two adjustable settings. And the algorithm is actually from the 1970s. It's pretty good, but again, that feels kind of old-fashioned. Go, of course, has control structures, but they're limited to if and for and switch and a very well-behaved go-to that doesn't let you do dangerous things. There's no do while, no guard, no do catch, no pattern matching, no control structures that return values. It's not that far off what was present in C, and yeah, the 1970s just made a little safer, a little harder to misuse. In other words, made a little boring. Go does have access controls. You have items that are inside a package that you can access and things you can't access from outside their package. Again, it's very simple, almost primitive. Go does have built-in concurrency support with Go routines and channels and select, which is pretty cool, but you might think that's something new. However, the entire concept is based on ideas from communicating sequential processes, or CSP, which was first described in, wait for it, 1978. And so you have this language that's mostly limited to features that are slightly older than that Commodore PET I learned to program on nearly four decades ago. But yet yeah, we have all these people who've come to GopherCon to learn more about it. And we have every startup in Silicon Valley using it to build their infrastructure. We have Docker and Kubernetes and etcd and Terraform and Vault and Console and Traffic and so many more projects. So what's going on? Why is everyone interested in this boring language? So before we answer that question, let's step back for a bit. I don't know if this looks familiar, but this is the Arcadico Bridge in Argolis, Greece. It's the oldest bridge in the world that's still standing today. It's over 3,000 years old and amazingly, still in use. Now, have you heard of MOCAS? It's the oldest computer program that's still in use today, written in 1958. Just a little over 60 years old, still running on an IBM 2098 Model E10 mainframe, keeping track of contracts and records for the U.S. Department of Defense. And fun fact, they tried to get rid of it about 20 years ago, still going strong today. Now, why am I talking about old bridges and old programs? It's because there's a universal truth about software development that software engineers don't like to talk about too much. We're really bad at writing software. Really bad. And I don't just mean that one person in the office that your boss sends out for coffee to reduce the bug count at crunch time. I mean everyone, me, you, 
and every other famous developer you can think of. We're all terrible. But the people who build and design bridges, they're pretty good at it. Bridges, for the most part, get built on time, on budget, last for dozens, hundreds, thousands of years. Bridge building is, if you think about it, kind of awesome. And it's such a common occurrence that it's also incredibly boring. No one's amazed when a bridge works correctly, and everyone is kind of amazed when software does work correctly. And you know, let's be fair, it's not surprising that we're terrible at building software. Humanity has been building bridges for over 3,000 years, we've been running software for a little over 60 years. We have 50 times the experience bridge building compared to software building. It shouldn't be a surprise that our bridges don't fail nearly as often as our software does. And that's a pretty good thing because we do depend on bridges all the time. You know, I've driven over this bridge over 5,000 times, never once thought it was going to fail. I have a lot more confidence in that bridge than I do in any piece of code I've ever written. Now, unfortunately, the world is very dependent on software. It might even depend now more on software than it does on bridges. And let me tell you, that scares me an awful lot. We have got to get better at writing software far faster than humanity got good at building bridges. Now, there are a few precious things we have learned in the last 60 years about writing programs, things that there's pretty much universal agreement on. We agree it's better to find problems earlier rather than later. And this is generally a true statement, but in software development, we've learned that finding a bug at compile time is far better than one that's found at testing time, and it's a heck of a lot better than a bug that's found by your customers, and it's infinitely better than a bug found by someone who's hacking your systems and stealing your money and your data. We agree that people are awful at manual memory management, right? I know, I know, there's someone who's watching right now who swears they can write bug-free deallocations across multiple threads. Now, assuming that was true, if you are the only one who can do that, do you wanna spend your time managing memory, or do you wanna solve interesting problems? We agree that code reviews help find bugs. We agree that on any project that requires more than one person, communication costs dominate. Anytime you've had a new teammate up to speed or anytime you've been that new teammate, you felt this pain. It was first described in the Mythical Man Month in 1975 as Brooks's Law. Adding people to a late project makes it later. Well, the best way to beat it is to limit the amount of information that needs to be shared in order to be successful. And we can combine these few things we know with another truth that is really settled in. Computers aren't getting much faster anymore. Now, during the 80s and the 90s, CPUs got faster every one or two years. Now, that's really changed. We look at the single core performance on CPUs. The fastest 2019 Core i9 is less than twice as fast as the fastest 2011 Core i7. So instead of getting faster, we add more cores to CPUs, which helps a bit. We look at the multi-core performance, it's a little better. Two more cores have been added and it's about twice as fast. But these are best case numbers. Here's something else that people don't talk about that much. RAM is much slower than CPUs and the gap is not getting better, even though CPUs aren't getting much faster. But wait, it's actually worse than it looks. RAM might be random access, but if you actually use it that way, it's slow. You can read around 40 gigabytes per second from RAM on a modern Intel CPU if the data is sequential. If you do a random read, it's a little less than half a gigabyte per second. The only way to get the actual maximum speed out of your CPU is to make sure it's working off of data that not only fits into the on-chip cache, but the data that you need is stored sequentially in RAM so it can be streamed into the on-chip caches. These charts are RAM access. They're from this fantastic blog post by Forrest Smith. Here's one last detail, the cost of having to follow pointers. He compared the speed of direct access to data to having to follow a pointer to your value. Here's what he said, quoting him. Sequentially summing values behind a pointer runs at less than one gigabyte per second. Random access, which misses the cache twice, runs at just a tenth of a gigabyte per second. Pointer chasing is 10 to 20 times slower. Friends don't let friends use linked lists. Ouch. So given these few precious things that we know about how to build software and the hardware that we have available to us, let's take another look at Go. Let's start with finding problems earlier rather than later. Go, the language might lack features, but it ships with a great set of tools. Go's compiler's fast, and that fast compilation speed is considered a feature by the Go team. It lets you quickly see if your code compiles, and if it doesn't, it lets you see where the problems are. That lets developers stay in the flow. Testing, it's built into the standard library to encourage developers to test their code and find their problems. And not only is unit testing included out of the box, but benchmarking and profiling and race checking is also. Very few languages ship with these kinds of tools. It's available for free as part of a standard distribution. 
All this just makes it easier to find problems quickly. Memory management. Well, as we know, Go has a garbage collector. You don't have to worry about keeping track of memory, and that's a fantastic thing. Among compiled languages, garbage collectors are kind of rare. Rust borrow checkers is a fascinating way to get high performance and memory management, but it effectively makes the developer into the garbage collector, and that can be hard to use correctly. Swift's R can actually still leak memory if you make mistakes and forget to declare some references as weak. Now, Go's GC isn't as performant as these semi-automatic systems, and there are situations where you do need that extra speed, but for the most part, it's certainly sufficient to use Go's garbage collector. Now, code reviews. Code reviews are important if they are done well. In order to have an effective code review, you need to make sure that the reviewers are focused on the right things. Low-quality code reviews spend time on silly things like formatting, but Go helps here because there are no formatting arguments when reviewing Go code, because all Go codes formatted the way GoFump says code should be formatted. And to be fair, code reviews are a two-way street. If you want a review that works well, you need to make sure that other people can understand your code. Go programs are supposed to be simple using a few well-understood constructs that haven't changed much in the decades since the language was released. And because there's no exceptions, no aspect-oriented programming, no inheritance, no method overriding, no overloading, it's very clear what code is calling what and where values are returned. If you stay away from modifying package-level variables in Go, and really, really you should, it's very easy to trace through a Go program and see exactly how data is being modified. And since Go has changed so little, you avoid the lava flow anti-pattern where you can tell exactly how old some code is based on when a feature it uses was added to the language. So on to reducing communication costs. How does Go help with this? We've already talked about Go's simplicity and stability and standard formatting. It makes it easier to communicate what your code is doing, and that's part of it. But there's something else. Go's implicit interfaces help teams write decoupled code. And you probably heard about duct typing in dynamic languages, right? It's the idea that you can assume that if there's a method on a type that matches the name you expect, you can call it and it probably does what you want. And this assumption surprisingly works a lot of the time. It lets you write code in parallel. Two people or teams or open source projects can write code without any coordination. It lets you plug things together and yeah, it reduces communication costs. Go takes this old idea of duct typing with, and with implicit interfaces, it adds on some type information. It makes duct typing more restrictive and more safe, and that makes it much more useful. Teams still develop in parallel, but now you're sure that the code takes in and returns the data that you expect. You're working together while working apart. So let's talk about Go and CPUs. The decision to make Go a compiled language has really paid off. Interpreted languages running in virtual machines seem like a really good idea when CPUs are getting faster every day. You know, back in the day, if your program wasn't fast enough, just wait a year, it was fine. But that doesn't work anymore. Compiling to native code is a lot less interesting than the latest virtual machine tricks, but it gives a big performance advantage. So let's see how Go's performance compares to some languages that run in virtual machines using micro benchmarks from the benchmark game. First, look at Python and Ruby compared to Go. Now in this chart, any percentage less than 100 means faster than Go, greater than 100 means slower. And um, that's a lot of red. There's one benchmark that where Python's faster today, oddly, not only twice as fast as Go, but faster than every other language with this one test. Um, there's no place where Ruby's faster than Go. And except for that one case, both languages produce code between 17% slower than Go and over 60 times slower. So here's Java and JavaScript. Now, these languages are much closer to Go's performance. JavaScript is faster than Go on one benchmark and slower on all the others, but the worst case for JavaScript is only about three times slower. Java and Go are actually pretty close in performance. Java is faster than Go in four cases, about the same in two cases, slower in four cases. The worst that Go does, about three times slower than Java. The best that Go does, about 50% faster. What we're seeing is that the only VM that can keep up with Go is Java's. Now, Java's hotspot VM is amazing technology, but the fact you need one of the best engineered pieces of software in the world in order to break even with a compiler that prioritizes compilation speed over optimization, that really says something. And you pay a price for that amazing technology. The memory usage of Java programs is many, many times larger than Go applications. So let's talk more about RAM. One of the things that throws off programmers coming in Go is having those explicit pointers and value types and having to know when to use each of them. If you've been programming in PHP or Java or Python or Ruby or JavaScript, all these explicit pointers are scary and weird. But that's actually backwards. Those languages are actually filled with pointers. 
Every class references a pointer to some memory, and classes with fields are also classes. Those fields are actually pointers off to some memory somewhere else. It's the value types that are different about Go. And those value types feel like another one of those 70s throwbacks, but they're actually Go's secret performance weapon. When you have a struct in Go that contains other structs, all the data stored sequentially in memory. This is different from classes in all those other languages, where each field in a class is actually a pointer to some other memory, which means your memory access in those languages is effectively random. And we just saw that random memory access is hundreds of times slower than sequential memory access. Go structs look like old, boring C structs, and you'd be right. But they're a great fit with how memory actually works in computers today. But there's a second advantage too. The garbage that garbage collectors collect is pointers that are no longer in use. So unlike all those other languages that hide their pointers, Go gives you control. Every pointer you don't create is a less work for the Go garbage collector. The reason why Go can get away with a simpler garbage collector with fewer knobs to tweak is that Go programs simply create less garbage. Being boring is just less work. And as we all know, CPUs are making up for their lack of increased speed with more cores. So it's good to use a language that takes advantage of this. And that's where Go's concurrency support comes in. Having language level support for concurrency in a runtime library that schedules Go routines across multiple threads means that when you have multiple CPU cores, those threads can be mapped to those cores. So Go is focused on the features and tooling that we know make it easier to create software and that better fit the memory and CPU architecture of modern computers. But maybe we're missing out, right? Maybe all those features that Go doesn't have help developers write code with fewer bugs, code that's easier to maintain. Well, it turns out, as far as researchers can tell, that doesn't seem to be the case. Now, you might have noticed I didn't mention fancy new features on the list of things we agree help us build software. All these languages adding all these clever new features, how much do they actually help us write code that's bug-free? In the end, probably not a lot. There was this paper in 2017 called A Large-Scale Study of Programming Language and Code Quality in GitHub. It looked at 729 projects, 80 million software lines of code, 29,000 authors, million and a half commits, and 17 programming languages to try and answer the question, what is the effect of programming languages on software quality? Their answer was, not much. So according to the paper, language design does have a significant but modest effect on software quality. Most notably, it does appear that strong typing is modestly better than weak typing, and among functional languages, static typing is somewhat better than dynamic typing. We also find that functional languages are somewhat better than procedural languages. It's worth noting that these modest effects arising from language design are overwhelmingly dominated by the process factors such as project size, team size, and commit size. Another group of researchers took a second look at this data and did a reproduction study in 2019 called On the Impact of Programming Languages on Code Quality. What they found was even more surprising. The reanalysis revealed that only four of the original languages correlated with abnormal defect rate, and even for those, the effect size is exceedingly small. Not only is it not possible to establish a causal link between programming language and code quality based on the data at hand, even the correlation proves questionable. If programming language choices don't matter, why choose Go? What these studies show is that process matters. Tooling, testing, performance, ease of long-term maintenance are much more important than trendy features. When properly used, Go's built-in tooling supports better process while providing time-tested features. Now, this isn't to say that all new features are bad, right? Bridge building technology has certainly advanced over the centuries and millennia. But would you be the first to go over a bridge that was built with brand new ideas and untested technology? Most people, they want the bridge builder to slow down, test out their ideas first. That might be boring, but it makes it more likely that the people who get on the bridge on one side make it to the other. Let's take a look and see how Go has applied this boring approach to generics. The Go team has been thinking about adding generics since the beginning. Back in December 2009, less than a month after the announcement of Go, Russ Cox wrote The Generic Dilemma, where he laid out his opinion on what adding generics would mean, choosing between slow programmers, slow compilers, or slow runtimes. That wasn't the end of the generics discussion, though. Behind the scenes from 2010 to 2013, the Go team went through four different proposals on how to implement generics, all rejected for one reason or another. The proposals and the reasons for the rejections were released to the public in 2016. At GoVercon 2018, a draft document was published that used contracts to implement generics. It included a review of generics implementations in other languages dating back to 1975, discussing the pros and cons of all its approaches. 
At GopherCon 2019, a revised draft document on contracts was released, rethinking the syntax for contracts. And this year, a new draft document was released, replacing contracts with interfaces. The Go team consulted with programming language experts, tried out their ideas in a minimal Go implementation called Featherweight Go, wrote a paper on what they learned. After 11 years, it feels like this draft document will be the one that's officially adopted, and the announcement quite possibly already took place at another talk at this conference. It'll probably take another year for the implementation to be complete, and the features that are proposed aren't as wide-ranging as what you find in generics and other languages. But it's just enough to address the pain points that have led to calls for generics while keeping Go code as fast to compile, fast to run, and easy for people to understand as it always has. This slow-moving approach by Go shouldn't be surprising. If we're going to build software infrastructure that's as reliable as bridges, we're going to need to use software technologies that are as well-tested and well-understood as the technologies that we use for physical infrastructure. That's why Go is mostly using features designed in the 1970s. We know they work. Go is boring, and that's fantastic. Let's all go out there and use it to build tomorrow's exciting applications. Thanks for your time, and enjoy the rest of the conference.